Joining us to take a look at that is Boris Zilberman. He's the Deputy Director of Congressional Relations at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Boris was born in Moscow and is an expert on legislative issues concerning defense and foreign affairs with a focus on Russia. Boris, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Boris, very easy question. Is this going to happen? Is Putin actually preparing the ground to send in some form of Russian forces, whether flagged or not flagged, trying to protect Russian-speaking minorities and essentially lop off a part of this country in anticipation of a referendum or maybe without a referendum? What do you think? Look, I think he's setting up the groundwork to have options to see if he can control the parts of Ukraine he wants to control without sending in troops, but also preparing the groundwork to have the sort of provocations uh, to pr create a pretext for sending in the troops. And I think you were exactly right about pointing out uh, the coal and the shale and the industry in eastern Ukraine uh, that he would ideally like to connect with Crimea and Odessa and the breakaway part of Moldova that would create uh, a landlocked western Ukraine and give uh, Crimea the resources it needs uh, to sustain itself and also give uh, Russia, Ukraine's industrial base. Acknowledging that all the economic power in Ukraine is in the east then, how much pushback could we expect from Ukraine then? How desperate and aggressive would they be in pushing back on any efforts by Putin to come into eastern Ukraine? Well, by their own admission, by their acting president, has said they only have uh, at the low end 6,000 battle-ready troops. Uh, so the first question is, what's their will and what's their power to do uh, to do a whole lot if the Russians go in full force? But you saw today in Donetsk, uh, or actually in Kharkov. Uh, where they have, are attempting to take back the uh, government building there that was taken by uh, pro-Russian uh, protesters. Uh, so you're seeing, you're seeing that play out, but it's a double-edged sword for the Ukrainians. If they go in too hard and there are deaths among pro-Russian protesters, that's the kind of pretext that Putin is looking for. So it's a very, very tough balancing act for them to uh, maintain control over eastern Ukraine at the same time not giving... Uh, pretext uh, to what Putin wants to do. So, Boris, what do we do? How do we, what do we do uh, as the United States, or I guess the, the Western world, to stop this? Since we haven't done really anything thus far other than issue some, you know, sharply worded letters, as Buck always likes to say, um, do, is there still economic sanctions, still things that we can do economically, since we're not going to put boots on the ground, that could stop this? What is going to deter Putin from moving forward? Look, there's still uh, banks we could go after. There are still uh, Gazprom and Rosneft. Uh, again, not, not why these options haven't been done yet by the administration is because they would hurt U.S. interests as well. So at what, it's a, at what point is what Russia uh, intend to do in Ukraine or other parts of Eastern Europe uh, balance out with the fact that we can do things to hurt them uh, economically still, but it, in turn it would hurt uh, European allies and uh, us as well. But Bucket, so I think that's, uh, that, that's the question. But Buck, at what point would the U.S. or Western allies agree to sanction something like Gazprom? And that would clearly hurt Europe as well. Is there, what would the point be? Because I can't see them agreeing to do that until Putin has already come in and taken parts of yeah. Eastern Ukraine. It's, it's not going to happen. In fact, I think even if he takes Eastern Ukraine, nothing is going to be done to reverse that. We may try to punish them, at least as sort of an act of protest. But that's all that it would essentially be. At this point, the U.S. doesn't even know how much, and this is a point that's been made by Walter Russell Mead at the Council on Foreign Relations several times, uh, how much they want to actually get involved in Ukraine. Because Russia has the ability to turn on and off the gas, literally, but also in general, to create a lot of economic pain for this country. And so if we are trying to take them as our, as our ward, if you will, if we're trying to take them on as somebody that we're responsible for, Russia can make this a failed, essentially a, a failed economy even more than it already is very quickly. So we have, as again in foreign policy we would say, no good options, Kristen. Right. And what you're seeing here is a, a failed situation because we can't have a Ukraine policy if we don't have a Russia policy. You know, Mead, um, Reid also made that point, is that we've just gone on for the past, you know, almost eight years now without, you can look soulfully into Putin's eyes and, yeah. and, you know, you can send these sanctions which don't really mean anything, but they're not a coherent policy and that's what we need going forward. Boris, what is the best case scenario from Vladimir Putin's point of view? What is it that he would want to see. If he could get exactly what he wants out of this equation, how does that play out? Because I think that's perhaps what we need to reverse engineer, get a sense of what he wants to get, what's the best scenario for him, and maybe try to prevent a little bit of that. 
I think that's exactly right. I mean, we have to look at their motives, uh, regardless of what anybody else says. We need to look at their motives. And Putin's best case scenario is taking East Ukraine, swinging down and land, swinging down, taking Odessa, cutting off any of the ports that Ukraine might have, and uh, reuniting with the breakaway part of Moldova. And that's probably his best case scenario to where Ukraine is landlocked, their economic base is taken away from them, and they're really in a state, they're basically a ward of, uh, of the West that we and the Europeans would have to support them. Uh, and that's probably his best case scenario if, if he thinks he can take uh, the next step without, uh, you know, with, with the same sort of uh, limited casualties or no casualties and, uh, that it had in Crimea. So. And it doesn't look like there's any reason why Putin won't achieve his best case scenario, Buck. There's no one willing to stand up to him, including, it seems, the Ukrainians themselves. There's no reason this shouldn't look like just the way Crimea played out. That's right. R rhetor uh, the rhetorical question Putin can pose of, or what? The deafening silence that we have at this point is not encouraging to anyone here or over in Ukraine. Boris, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me on.